talking to us again, Lou. Um, when we spoke last, you mentioned catastrophes, and of course I know you spent a lot of time developing catastrophe theory. Mm. Um, and that very much links to what I'd like to ask you about now, which is a word that, again, is used a lot in, uh, in, in the media yes. and, and by coaches and, and athletes themselves, and that is choking. Yeah. Um, so what's choking? Well, choking, it's a, it's a journalistic term, really, but it, it, you see it now even in research papers. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it's simply when an, an athlete, it's a term that's used when an athlete fails to deliver the expected level of performance under stressful circumstances. Nice. So t I phrased that fairly carefully. I didn't mention the word anxiety, mm -hmm. but usually it's assumed that anxiety is the cause of choking. Okay, yeah. but you see them as different. You see choking in I, a different light? Uh, I, I think there are circumstances when somebody could fail to deliver um, the expected levels of performance under pressure N not simply because of anxiety, okay. that's all. Uh, usually, I'm sure usually it is because of anxiety. Because yeah. I think people think of, of, of catastrophic yes. differences yeah. between what you'd expect and what they're actually doing. Yes. Is, is that necessary for choking or can choking be no. different? No, no, I'd actually... Um, y y when, I, when we talked about anxiety, I, I mentioned that um, when people are anxious, they often invest more effort in what they train to, to achieve. Yeah. And, um, and that sometimes this could be a good thing and sometimes it could be a bad thing. So sometimes when people invest more effort in something um, and they lack confidence in the ability in there or they're worried about their ability to yeah. deliver this skill, yeah. they start trying to consciously control bits of the movement that they've learned very well and that actually their body's pretty good at performing automatically, mm -hmm. but because they try and consciously control it, it starts to break down and fall right. apart. Right. Is um, this what we call re reinvestment? Reinvestment, okay. reinvestment theory, that's what that's about. Um, and similarly, of course, that increased effort could lead to enhanced performance on, sure. on other occasions, sure. and those are called clutch performances, right. which you rarely hear about. Yes. Yes, People don't talk about those very choking, much. It? It's usually choking. And, um, and choking, clearly, somebody who aspires to perform at a high level, for example, like the Olympics, clearly somebody who chokes has got a huge problem mm -hmm. on their hands. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, looking at individual differences in things that might lead somebody to, to choke is a, is a good is potentially a good thing. Right. Um, I have some very interesting. There's all sorts of standard stuff. The standard traditional stuff is there are lots of processes that could cause choking. Mm -hmm. So um, reinvestment is one. Um, interference, interfering thoughts. So people teach athletes ways to get rid of the interfering thoughts, yeah. to restructure them into positive sure. thoughts. Yeah. Narrowing of attention. Narrowing of attention, selectively attending to threatening cues instead of the important mm -hmm. bits. There are a whole raft of sure. things sure. that are, I just, I don't mean this dismissively. The, that's the standard intervention stuff. Right. Okay, okay. Yeah, you, you know. The, the stuff we've been doing more recently is a bit more interesting, I think. We started looking at the, a, there's a personality um, structure, really, a framework for personality that's based around two um, systems, a punishment system and a reward system okay. that, that we have in our brains that it's sensitive to those diff and different cues. And we thought that people who had a tendency to choke would have a strong sensitivity to punishment cues and a weak sensitivity to reward cues. So in other words, they're in this environment and all they see is the bad stuff that could happen. They don't see any of the good things that could happen and that's what leads them to choke. In actual fact, the results that we found were the exact opposite of that. <laughs> so what we found was that the people who choked the least actually were most sensitive to punishment cues and least sensitive to reward cues. Wow. So in other words, they saw the threat and they didn't necessarily see the opportunity quite so easily. Right. And these were fairly high level cricketers. These were like mm -hmm. national, mm -hmm. you know, they were on, they were junior mm -hmm. national level cricketers right. in England, you know, development sure. squads. 
And, um, and the people who were worst, the people who choked the most, actually had the profile that we thought would be most beneficial, mm. which was we thought people who saw the punishment, the threat, and the opportunity, they'd have a balanced view of it and they'd be fine, actually right. they're the worst. Right. Right. And then we did some more studies and rummaged about in this, and what we found was that the people who are sensitive to punishment cues, uh, they, they, it's like an early warning system for them. They see stuff early and they prepare early, they get organised early, they make responses right. because they make time for themselves. And the people who see both um, sets of cues, mm -hmm. both the threat and the opportunity, get a bit confused by it, by a sort of approach avoidance conflict. Do I, okay. do I go for this, do I not go for it? Okay. Um, and this led to us to develop a program, an intervention program with Young England cricketers right. that's based around punishment in huh. essence, which is quite fascinating. It's counterintuitive. It really. is counterintuitive. Yes. And what we've done is we've based this program around consequences. Mm -hmm. So there are clearly defined consequences for people failing to achieve certain performance mm -hmm. expectations or attitude or behavior, turning up late, wrong kit, sure. wh whatever, just there are consequences for things. And my argument about it, this is where it gets a bit more controversial, is my argument about <laughs> it is that, see, in educational circumstances, we don't do punishment. No. Okay. So my argument is that we do our young people an enormous disservice because we teach them that the world's full of opportunity sure. and good things that will happen yeah. to you and the worst that should ever happen to you is that you don't get rewarded. Right. Yeah. yeah. And actually that should no only... Failures. There's no failures. Mm. And that not getting rewarded should only happen very rarely. Right. Most of the time you should get rewarded for everything. Sure. And so they, they grow up slowly. To, to expect this is how the world is, they get into their yeah. teens, they find out this is not how the world is, there are all sorts of consequences for all sorts of things. I think actually there are, you're not alone, I think no. there are people now voicing that. Yeah, and, they, and then they feel let down and they get angry mm -hmm. and they mm -hmm. turn to vandalism or whatever, yeah, you know, true. so this is about creating the expectation that there are consequences in life yes. and you have to learn mm. to deal with the consequences. It's interesting that not only is it a lesson for life, but it actually helps you deal with sporting Of course it does. Situations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it helps you to judge the seriousness of consequences mm. and have a perspective. Yeah, and I think perspective is probably a pretty key thing in choking. Yeah. Well, that, thank you so much for your thoughts. <laughs> very, very interesting and, as you said, Somewhat controversial. A little bit. We like that. <laughs> yeah, good. Thanks very much. Luke. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for your time. Yeah, nice to talk to you.